it, it amuses me sometimes how much people who trained in computer science think we know about the brain. Right. <laughs> they, they come to me and ask, Matt, you know, you know about the brain. How does the brain do X? And I say, I hate to disappoint you, but why couldn't it be that AI systems are incredibly benevolent? You know, when we think about wisdom in studies of religion and spirituality, our usual assumption is that insight leads to benevolence. This is Brain Inspired. Hey, everyone. I am Paul Middlebrooks, and the voice that you heard previously is that of my guest today, Matt Botvinnik. Matt is the director of neuroscience research at a little company you might know called DeepMind. So DeepMind, as I'm sure you do know, is the AI research company behind systems like AlphaZero that are demolishing uh, all their opponents in games like chess and Go. And of course, they do a lot more. The approach to artificial intelligence at DeepMind is heavily inspired by neuroscience. Uh, And Matt and I discuss that approach and that philosophy. Uh, We talk about reinforcement learning in AI and in brains. And we cover his work suggesting that the prefrontal cortex could work with the dopamine system to together serve as a meta-learning system. Uh, We also talk about his recent research into creating theory of mind in AI agents and a lot more. This episode is a little bit longer than usual. Matt was generous with his time. And as you'll hear, he has a generous spirit as well. That's right. I said spirit. So... I continue to love doing this podcast, and I hope that you enjoy it. A quick thank you to recent Patreon supporters, Jay, Judith, The Stoic. Thank you guys for helping me combat the ever-present eye rolls I get from my wife whenever I tell her that this is a worthwhile endeavor. You guys are awesome. You can find the show notes and learn how to support the show at braininspired.co. All right, enjoy your time with Matt. All right, Matt Botvinnik, thank you and welcome to the Brain Inspired podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You, sir, are the director of neuroscience uh, research at DeepMind, and you came to DeepMind via neuroscience, most recently from Princeton University, and you have a a ton of uh, accolades and um, areas that you've researched in neuroscience in the past, Uh, kind of famous for conflict monitoring uh, cognitive control, the function of the anterior cingulate cortex, and, and on and on. And you and I actually have a, a common past, partly. You got your PhD at CMU, Carnegie Mellon University, and, and you spent some time after that in the uh, Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition in Pittsburgh, yeah. which mm-hmm. is the program that I got my PhD in. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and you, I guess you were there pretty early on, right when it formed, I suppose. Yeah, I was I was around when uh, it took on that name, and I, my my PhD was actually through the CNBC. And uh, yeah, I definitely would not be where I am or doing the things that I'm doing today if I hadn't had that training. It was it was really fantastic. Anything you miss about Pittsburgh? Uh, anything I miss about Pittsburgh? I miss <laughs> the French fries on the sandwiches. Do uh, you? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good, yeah. It's changed a lot since I was there, from what I understand. But yeah, I had a wonderful time in Pittsburgh. I don't think the French fries have changed, though. I think they're yeah, the same. <laughs> but so this is interesting. Before you got into neuroscience and in cognitive neuroscience, you were an art history major. So I would be amiss uh, if I didn't ask you what you think of these new generative adversarial networks that are generating these new artworks. Do you have a yeah. Do you have a take on those things? Uh, it's funny. I when I first started uh, spending time at DeepMind, the generative models were, shall we say, uh, <laughs> still in development compared to where they are now. And they they would uh, when you know the the idea with the generative model is that you um, you build an autoencoder, so you feed in an image, and then it tries to reconstruct that image through a sort of coding bottleneck. But then you can you can flip a switch and use it to imagine new images. Mm. Uh, and you hope that those images, if every, if, if you're doing your job right, then those images should essentially come from the same distribution as the original. And I remember when I first spent time at DeepMind, the the images that were being generated uh, in that second mode were quite beautiful and sort of mysterious. And 
they kind of seemed like things you would that would come out of a dream state or something like that. Yeah. And so, yeah, I did. I remember thinking, geez, somebody should like pick some of these and make a make a show out of it, make a gallery show out of it. And that may, for all I know, have actually happened. The problem is that the generative models have gotten better and better. So now when you put the the system into generative mode, it just produces something that looks like an actual picture of a hamburger. Right. So they're not they're not nearly as aesthetic as they used to be. They're they're far too realistic. Well, one of the a portrait just sold at uh, at the famous I cannot Soothby Soothby's is that Is right? Sotheby's? Sotheby's, yeah, uh, just sold for a ton of money. Um, it did it really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hadn't seen that. Anyway, I, I thought, you know, because I have an artist friend down the road here whom I thought I should get him in the studio and just ask him, like, put up these pictures and ask him what he thinks uh, yeah. about the art, the quality, you know, and things like that. So there's definitely something very um, uh, there's it, it, there's something about the images that that are produced by generative models, especially of like a, a couple generations back, you know, like last year, uh, um, <laughs> that it's not just that they're interesting. You you have this feeling that they're tapping into something in your visual system, so something very primordial in your visual system. Uh, and I don't think anybody really understands uh, why that's the case. But like I say, you know, what's being produced now is much less interesting because the generative models are so much better that they really <laughs> do produce images that look um, photographic, even though they're not showing you, uh, uh, you know, they're not just duplicating some photograph that was in the training set. Right. What, I'm, what I'm waiting for is synthetic music. That'll be a big breakthrough. I, People have been trying to do this with neural networks back, you know, since the days when I was at the CNBC in Pittsburgh. Right, right. And um, even back then, what people were, what people found was that you could get so far as generating plausible melodies. Um, it is possible to build a system that learns from examples how to generate interesting melodies. What wasn't working back then, and I, to be honest, I don't know the state of the art these days. It's not something that we're working on at DeepMind as far as I know. But what, what wasn't in place were the long-term dependencies. You know, the way that a, a, a movement of a, a, a symphony movement in sonata form will start with one theme and then move on to a related theme and then move on to a related theme. And then there's a long development and then you come back to the original theme. Right. So there are these long time like, dependencies that play out over minutes, um, tens of minutes in some cases. And at least back in the era when I was following this kind of work, it wasn't possible to uh, for systems to learn those kinds of long term dependencies. Interestingly, we're coming back to that that problem in AI research now. But That's yeah, right. I'll be I'll yeah. be very excited when we get uh, some uh, some interesting music out of these systems. Yeah, well, it is interesting because what we're going to talk about today is building some, well, you know, within general AI, trying to build back some human um, intelligence yeah. into these systems. So, but so you have a background in cognitive neuroscience, and and you got into AI later. I'm assuming you got it into it later. What do you think? Should an aspiring student who's interested in, in neuroscience and AI, should, should they master one or the other first? Or is that a moot point now? Are they just studied together now, you know, the cognitive neuroscience and AI? Or, or should they do it concurrently? Yeah. What do you think? So I, I got into AI as it's now been redubbed. Right. In a, in a kind of in, in imperceptible way because the, what, what got me interested in in neuroscience and psychology was neural networks, artificial neural networks. And, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, um, when I started doing this kind of work, there was this lovely, um, lovely lack of clarity uh, in terms of when we were doing psychology or neuroscience and yeah. when we were just thinking about how to build an intelligent system. And, you know, I, I ended up pursuing a, a, a career in neuroscience and cognitive psychology, but all along the way, I've always kind of felt pulled toward just thinking about intelligence in general from time to time. And one, one thing that I'm really enjoying about working at DeepMind is that I get to work both sides of the field without worrying too much day to day whether I'm doing one or the other. <laughs> but to, to get to your question, I feel like that's a question that people in academia are wrestling with very actively. Uh, both students who are looking at the very dynamic landscape of opportunities that they'll have after they are done their training, mm. and also degree programs um, who are looking at the same dynamic landscape and wondering how to set their students up uh, as best they can. And I guess the answer I would give is that there's really no, there's no one size fits all. There are definitely large sectors of neuroscience research for which training in AI 
is probably not the best use of your time if you're a grad <laughs> student. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're interested in glial cells, um, exactly, yeah. or you know, uh, receptor dynamics, or you know, the, I, you know, I just, I, I don't think people should see this as a bandwagon that they have to get on. If you're interested in other aspects of neural function, um, then maybe your best, the best use of your time is to study biology. You know, I also don't think that everybody who's st- who is into AI has to go off and get a PhD in neuroscience. There are clearly aspects of, of AI research that can be pursued quite f- fruitfully without knowing a thing about the brain. Right. Um, you know, as is proven by the many people who are doing successful AI research right now. And for all that we, for all we think we know about the brain, we know very little anyway. So, that, and that's, yeah. yeah and that's, uh, it, it amuses me sometimes how much people who trained in computer science think we know about the brain. Right. <laughs> they, they come to me and ask, Matt, you know, you know about the brain. How does the brain do X? And I say, I hate to disappoint you, but Isn't that we frustrating? don't frustrating? It's so frustrating <laughs> to have to say that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that, that's a good answer. But I mean, the, yeah, the, 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 the final piece of that is that there really is a growing area of overlap. And, you know, there is, there is a, a growing market, both in the literal economic sense and in the sort of more intellectual sense for people who speak all of these languages. And I'm, you know, it's my hope that academia is, is seeing that and is, you know, building, building curricula that are appropriate. I had to learn a lot of what I know about machine learning and relevant areas of mathematics, uh, in, information theory, uh, optimization, mm. uh, um, statistical inference. I had to pick up a lot of that stuff once I was done with my degree, because it just wasn't part of the standard neuroscience and psychology curriculum. Right. And, uh, and I think, you know, I, I, I hope and expect that, uh, especially cognitive science oriented programs are building these interdisciplinary curricula. Um, because I do think that, that it's, um, you know, I think it's the answer both for AI to have people around who understand what's going on to the extent that we do understand that right. uh, in the brain uh, and for neuroscientists to really understand what it means to process information, if that's what the brain is actually doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which, of course, it is. So, man, you what a job you have. What a, a title you have, Director of Neuroscience Research. Can you just describe uh, briefly and kind of an overall picture of your role uh, and what you do, you know, on a day-to-day kind of basis and what you oversee? Sure, Absolutely. We, we organize things at DeepMind into uh, groups that we call teams, um, and I'm the head of a team that we call the neuroscience team. In some ways, it's a misnomer because most of the people on the team are doing fairly like straightforward AI research. It does turn out to be the case that most of the people doing that kind of research have at least distantly some background in neuroscience or psychology or oriented maybe a little bit more above the mean um, for, uh, for DeepMind in questions that are very inspired by cognitive science or neuroscience. But we have people on the team like um, Greg Wayne and Peter Battaglia, Alex Lurchner, who are writing papers that, you know, if you, if you just read the paper without knowing them, you, would, you wouldn't necessarily think of it as neuroscience or psychology work. But then we have other activities on the team that really are more oriented toward neuroscience. And the reason for that is uh, not that we're, you know, our primary mission is to solve intelligence, that, you know, we're aligned with the rest of the company in exactly that sense. But we think that working on questions in neuroscience, selected questions, may help us get the answers that we need in order to make better AI systems. So hmm. we do we do some neuroimaging, some fMRI work. We do um, computational neuroscience we do human behavioral experiments, uh, mm. just like people do at, in university departments, just to see, uh, try to figure out what makes people so smart. So we can just try to bottle that and put it in our in our artificial systems. And we try to kind of find some way of co- making all of that activity coherent. <laughs> the, other thing, the other thing that we do um, is, one challenge of the kind of AI work that we do at DeepMind is that since it involves learning, we often end up with systems that are doing something that looks quite intelligent, but we can't tell by just watching their behavior exactly how they're doing what they're doing. Mm. So you end up with a problem that's quite analogous to the problem that a neuroscientist has. You're watching uh, an animal do some, you know, navigate or make decisions in an intelligent way, or you're watching uh, another person do, so- do something intelligent. 
And you know there's something interesting going on in their brains that's giving rise to that behavior, but it's a research project to figure out what that is. Hmm. Uh, and we end up with the same problem in AI work. So we have a group within my team at DeepMind whose full-time job it is to try to do neuroscience on these AI systems and figure out exactly how it is that they're doing what they're doing. Very good. L let's get into a little bit of the philosophy uh, of, of the DeepMind approach. So there's this Really nice review in Neuron uh, from last year. Uh, and in the review, you lay out why neuroscience is important for AI and vice versa in the quest to understand intelligence, like you just said, and, and build general AI. Yeah. So I often wonder whether we're selling ourselves short using human intelligence and neuroscience as a guide uh, to develop general AI. But there's this uh, a well-stated argument for studying the brain in the paper, and it goes as follows. The space of possible solutions to general AI is just is super vast, right? And in all likelihood, really sparsely populated. So there are very yeah. few solutions in this large space. And humans are the only example that we have uh, for general AI. And therefore, human cognition is the smartest way to proceed. And then once you recognize that, you have to then further say that animal cognition is important in that it provides this window into higher level cognition. So yeah. I, I just think that's a pretty solid argument for using human AI, even though it could be that we are selling ourselves short. What do you mean by selling ourselves short? Well, what if one of the other three solutions in this vast space are simpler, better, uh, you know, outstrip our abilities immensely, yeah. you know, things like that. But how would we know? How would we get there? Yeah. So I think you've, you've stated the case uh, very nicely. I mean, for me, it's much easier to, to motivate this decision to attend to neuroscience if you state things in the negative, rather than saying, we need to attend to neuroscience in order to solve AGI, instead say, wouldn't it be crazy not to pay any attention to neuroscience? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I, think, I think there really is a good analogy in the, the history of aviation. It, it, and this is actually a little bit of a complicated story to tell because people often use this exact example to make the opposite case. I've heard people say, oh, well, you know, paying attention to neuroscience may be a bad idea. Look at aviation. Right. People didn't succeed in building the airplane until they deliberately ignored birds because <laughs> birds were distracting them somehow. And, you know, obviously they weren't trying to build, the, the task was not to build a bird, it was to build something out of, uh, you know, wood and, and other kinds of material, not feathers and without flapping. And so the bird thing was a big distraction and it slowed everything down. In fact, if you look at the history, that's categorically false. That's fake news. I'm here <laughs> oh, to tell geez. you. <laughs> um, so the history of aviation actually played out quite differently. Um, and if you look at what uh, helped the Wright brothers finally succeed, even in the final stages of uh, designing their aircraft, they were thinking very concretely and immediately and in a detailed way about birds. Mm. They had a problem with um, what they called lateral control, getting the airplane to kind of stay going forward or to, to, you know, to turn where they wanted it to turn. And they were reading books on how birds handle this problem. And birds do an interesting thing by twisting their wings in a particular way. And they, the Wright brothers used exactly that solution in their, in their first aircraft. So, you know, my attitude is if you're, you know, if you're someone who's trying to build the first airplane and outside your window, there are birds flying around. It just seems kind of crazy and perverse not to pay any attention to that. Um, uh, you know, if nothing else, it's an existence proof, right? You probably right. wouldn't even be trying to build an airplane if you hadn't seen the birds in the first place. And actually, neuroscience still plays an existence proof role in a lot of, in, in a lot of ways. There are things that our AI systems can't do that we probably wouldn't even be aspiring to if we didn't have human cognition in mind, certain mm. kinds of rich inference and flexibility. And, um, but even at a more detailed level, I think um, just, it's just patently foolhardy to ignore neuroscience and psychology as a source of information. It would be, it would be equally foolish to be over literal, uh, to ignore the fact that we're not trying to build a brain here. You know, there are lots of things about the brain that are probably totally irrelevant. For example, the brain has to be you know, it can't be larger than a size that allows it to go down the birth canal, right? I mean, it, it has to be small enough to do that. We don't really have to worry about that in AI. So right. there are plenty of things about the brain that are we we know from the out from the outset are going to be irrelevant. 
but yeah, I think the aviation story is pretty pretty compelling. That's what keeps keeps me looking at neuroscience. Jeez, Matt, I didn't mean to get you all defensive. I'm not trying to replace <laughs> your team at, neuro, at, uh, at your neuroscience. Yeah, this team. is this is a surprisingly it's a surprisingly contentious issue, though. Hmm. I don't know that it's contentious within DeepMind. One thing that I've been delighted to find at DeepMind is that there's a a very widespread interest in neuroscience. But I have I've been involved in debates in the larger AI community, there are, there are definitely people, you know, leaders in, in the AI community whose attitude it is that maybe neuroscience was useful at some point in the past, but AI has matured to a point where we no, really, no longer really need that scaffolding. So this is apparently a, a topic on which reasonable people can disagree, hmm. but um, that's, not where, that's not where we're putting our money. I, I mean, and it should be stated again that DeepMind's goal is not to make a brain, not to understand the brain. It's it's to build intelligence, build general intelligence. And and in that service, uh, it employs neuroscience as a guide. So really the focus is on sort of the computational processes. If you want to talk about David Marr's three levels. Um, yeah. So the top two levels are the computational level, um, which are like the goals of, of an agent or individual and the processes and computations to realize those goals, which is like the algorithmic level, uh, the second yeah the second highest level in David Mars, and without regard really to the mechanisms underlying the the, the physical processes, uh, which is the implementation uh, right. in, in Mars level. So so that's really how DeepMind seeks to build intelligence is is by focusing on these top two levels and not necessarily the, the mechanisms. So you don't need to un understand the mechanisms all the way down to the neuron, essentially. Yeah, that's right. There, there's, 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 one, there's one way in which thinking about that lowest level, the implementation might be interesting, even from an AI perspective, hmm. down the line. I, I think, I think, you know, as we argued in that neuron paper, I think, given where we are at the moment, the computational and algorithmic levels are clearly the most important for us to be looking at. But the implementational level is interesting, given the small, the very small amount of energy the brain needs in order to do what it does. Yeah, that's a big problem. Yeah, if you compare that, I mean, I'm not I'm not an engineer, and so I can't give you numbers. But coarsely speaking, the amount of raw energy that it takes for us to run large AI um, or, or large AI jobs now is um, simply uh, you know it's astronomical compared to the energy that the brain seems to get by with doing comparable things. So maybe at some point, once we've figured out those top two levels, it will be of interest to understand. Um, how the brain is able to do what it does with such, you know, you know, sipping through such a narrow straw uh, on on the energy supply. But having said that, yes, I, the, the computational and algor algorithmic levels clearly are are critical. Sometimes it's hard to sometimes it's harder to distinguish between these levels than we would like. So, for example, there are things like uh, oscillations. There, there, there's all sorts of fascinating information coming out of of neuroscience research these days about structure that you find at, at the level of oscillations in brain activity, whether that's at the level of the action potentials, the, the, fi the neural firing patterns, or at the level of voltages, the, the, the membrane potentials, the, the, the variables that sort of underlie those spiking, uh, that spiking activity. And, you know, it's hard to say at this point in history, whether those, those oscillations are a detail that we should Kind of put on the implementation side. It's ah, it's just a low-level detail. We can kind of ignore that when we take lessons away from neuroscience, or maybe it's something fundamental. Maybe there's information being processed at the level of those oscillations that there's computational work being done by those oscillations that um, we should be, you know, it would help us to build these kinds of oscillations into our AI systems. So we often face this uncertainty when we look at the neuroscience literature about which side of that line. The thing we're reading about falls on. You're tempting me to go down the consciousness road here because that's what everyone wants to talk uh -oh. about. Is no, uh, <laughs> I hope I didn't hope I didn't tempt you that. No, I'm that. not going to. Don't worry about it. Don't <laughs> worry. Maybe later after a few drinks, we'll sure, uh, sure. Okay, before we really get into this recent work, this awesome recent work that that you and your team have done, tell me. Uh, I'm going to go through this historical progress in, in my mind and thinking like a hundred years from now, this bird's eye view of the history of um, the AI neuroscience development here. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about a few stages and, and then I want to just get your take on it and then we'll move on. 
let's start with the pre-modern stage, uh, and that's the symbolic, good old-fashioned AI where, you know, logical AI where humans humans are symbol manipulators. So this is the early AI, pre-statistical yeah. deep learning models, right? Yeah. Then I'll say there's this first stage, uh, and these are the percep perceptron days and uh, PDP, um, uh, parallel distributed processing days, that are loosely based on what was known about neurons at the time. And even yeah. there was a lot more known at the time, but just really abstracting very, uh, very few qualities to implement these things. Mm -hmm. And then the second stage, these core ideas that were just innovated, the perceptron, et cetera, uh, were really made to work. So there's this confluence of big data that we have and computational power and the ability to implement these things. Uh, yeah. And this is when like added layers were added and convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural ne networks, uh, including adding some technical tricks, some inspired by brain science, most not, I would say. Uh, and, and then, of course, the, the re reinforcement learning driven conquest of the gaming world, you know, that mm -hmm. DeepMind does. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to say now we're at this third stage and now we have these statistically awesome models. Uh, you know, we've gone completely away from good old fashioned AI with a symbol based AI. AI wins all the games that we train it on. It blows us out of the water. The general public is being taught to fear uh, AI because it's going <laughs> to take over the world uh, and will be its pets, you know. Um, and there's, But there's a lot of backlash now from people like Melanie Mitchell, whom I'll speak with in a week or two, mm. uh, like Josh Tenenbaum, Brendan Lake, uh, who are saying, hey, this smart AI is, is really pretty dumb. Uh, it's, it's pretty narrow and really far away from general AI, which is what people mm. think of when, when you just say AI. And it's time to learn about and add in some of what we know about how humans really learn. So mm. uh, what do you think about that? A hundred years from now, looking back on it, what would you change about that story? Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great admirer of, of uh, Brendan and, and, and Josh, um, and I talk to them about this kind of stuff all the time. And it, it's funny because, you know, reading the literature, you might think that there are these, you know, very clashing perspectives. But right. Actually, when we get together to talk about it, I, I honestly think we're much more on the same page than it, than it might appear. In other words, I think in the end, these are all pieces of the puzzle, and we just have to put the whole puzzle together. Good old-fashioned AI was you know, focused on questions that are still entirely fundamental today. Right. Um, how does reasoning uh, play out? Um, what's the format of representations uh, that you need in order to reason? Uh, what's the format of representations you need in order to plan, to construct new knowledge out of old knowledge, to make inferences that bring to bear the right sort of default assumptions? The problem with good old-fashioned AI was that there wasn't enough of a mechanism involved for learning these kinds of representations, uh -huh. um, especially learning them f in, in a perceptually grounded way um, through actual in interaction with the physical world. Right. And so, you know, it, it was necessary for AI researchers to do what came to be called knowledge engineering, where you had to simply effectively write down in your computer code yeah. everything that a human would know about the world. Like, uh, you know, a hamburger has uh, half a bun on the bottom and half a bun on the top. And, you know, uh, <laughs> every little thing that a human knows about the world, which is obviously an impossible task. There's no, there's no way to do that. But that doesn't mean that the, the objectives of good old-fashioned AI were, were misguided. We're, we're wrestling with exactly those challenges today. We have a way of developing grounded knowledge. Deep learning and deep reinforcement learning is wonderful for um, making sense of sensory information and interacting um, in a kind of grounded agent-based way with a physical environment. But now we need to figure out a way of growing that knowledge to the point where it makes contact with the sorts of structure that good old-fashioned AI was interested in. We want abstractions, right? We want mm -hmm. a, a language of thought. We want systems that can reason um, and draw conclusions from their past experiences. And we also, it, you know, it's very true. We want systems that learn rapidly because they leverage their existing knowledge. We want systems that don't need to uh, play chess for, you know, thousands and thousands of games before they start playing reasonably. Um, we want a system that is more like a human where, you know, if you've never played chess before, I can sit you down and explain the rules. 
you won't be a grandmaster after an hour, but you'll be playing. <laughs> and uh, in a, you know, by the way, that none of this is to is to take away from the the profound impact that these existing deep RL systems have, like AlphaGo. I mean, I wouldn't be a deep mind if it weren't for right. uh, the Atari work that was going on and AlphaGo. I mean, these are mind blowing breakthroughs to my mind. But it is true. The next thing to, that we have to take on as we go down this path toward true AGI is we have to combine that kind of deep, sophisticated knowledge gained through huge amounts of experience. Um, we have to build systems that have that, but that are also flexible and that are cognitively nimble. They can make sense of a new situation very rapidly uh, based on a few observations. So, you know, these are these are things that cognitive scientists have been focused on for for years. Uh, including me in some of my research. Mm -hmm. And so we need to get them into the picture. But building systems that have only that kind of that kind of nimbleness misses the other side of the equation because the only techniques that we really have for building artificial systems that appear to have that kind of flexibility is to retreat to this situation where we're building a lot of the knowledge in by hand. So the bottom line is, I think, you know, to answer your question, a hundred years from now, I think the narrative is going to go, Look, you know, there were these different um, research communities focused on different, you know, pieces of the elephant, you know, the old parable. And the success story that we hope is going to, you know, unfold over these hundred years or, you know, maybe the next 20 years is going to really involve putting these pieces together in a way that allows us to avoid the kind of dead ends that each of these approaches um, that have been explored so far have run into. Well, that's a, really a hell of a segue to talk about some of your recent work here. Oh, uh, good. Okay. <laughs> so uh, where, where you're building in these um, abilities to learn how to learn. So, okay. So the, the paper that we're about to talk about is called Prefrontal Cortex as a Meta Reinforcement Learning System. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as we've talked about, these deep reinforcement learning systems um, have come to dominate game playing, Atari, chess, Go. Uh, it was just announced that you guys can predict protein folding structures, which is, you know, a huge uh, finding. And as you said, one of the many challenges in AI, in deep learning, in deep reinforcement learning, is that learning is slow and takes a million examples of labeled data to, to get anywhere. The solution is to learn how to learn, the capacity for meta-learning. You have previously, um, recently, worked out uh, a way to do this in AI using reinforcement learning by positing a first re reinforcement learning system that trains a second reinforcement learning system. And then the second system uh, can act independently and adapt and learn faster. So that is in a previous paper, uh, all in AI. And in this current paper, you use that AI inspiration to explore uh, how it might occur in the brain. Yeah. I guess we've described meta-learning, which is learning how to learn and uh, the ability to uh, learn various tasks and improve uh, faster with each new task that you learn. Uh, yeah. So maybe now but we can just describe reinforcement learning in general before we dive into the brain. So, so how does reinforcement learning broadly work at the sort of algorithmic level? Sure. So reinforcement learning, depending on who you ask, really is not about a, a solution. It's about a particular kind of problem, which is I am in a learning situation and the feedback that I'm getting is is formatted strictly as rewards and punishments, or positive rewards and negative rewards. Mm -hmm. So this is in contrast to what would be called supervised learning, where you know I give you a I give you a problem, you give me your answer, and then I, if you're wrong, I tell you exactly what you should have said. Right. right so that's right. that's the that's the setup. For example, in a lot of image classification tasks, I show the system a picture of a kitten. It says car. I said no. <laughs> Not car, kitten. That, that's a supervised learning situation. With the finger up. He had the fi held the yeah, finger up. No, no. no. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, so in a reinforcement learning setting, in, instead, uh, you know, you would show a picture of the kitten. The image classification system would say car, and you would say, mm, no, you're cold. That, you know, bad. Uh -huh. Bad answer. And if it said kitten, you'd say, great, great job. And so you can see... The difference there, the, the, the information that's available in that form of feedback signal is much thinner because you're not being told exactly what you're supposed to do. Um, and so the it, reinforcement learning problems are fundamentally different from supervised learning problems in the sense that 
you have to experiment. You have to try things out. You have to uh, explore uh, the space of possible responses uh, in order to discover what gets you the most reward. Mm -hmm. So, and the name of the game is to is to find a way of responding to the situations you're being presented with that maximizes your maximizes your reward. So that that's the that's the problem setup. There are a variety of ways of then tackling that in terms of learning algorithms. Uh, one way is to build a model of the world to try to understand how things work. Uh, so then you can then leverage that knowledge in yeah. order to maximize reward. So this is, we refer to this as model based reinforcement learning. So if you're, if you're learning how to use a new cell phone, probably there's a component of, of model based reinforcement learning. You're trying to understand the, the, if then rules of this phone, if I press this icon, then that thing happens. If I press this button on the outside, the volume changes. Um, and then once you have that knowledge, you can make decisions that, that fit with your goals and maximize reward. But then there's another, in a way simpler approach that you can take to a reinforcement learning problem, which is, uh, which is called model free learning. And this is, this is actually an approach that was originally inspired by animal conditioning research. So mm -hmm. this is a good example of where psychology really uh, inspired fundamental work in AI. And the idea here is a little bit, it's, it's reminiscent of what you would do to train, say, your dog to do a trick. You wait until your dog does something that looks a little bit like the trick you want that you want her to do, and then you give her a treat. And then you wait until she does that again, and maybe it looks randomly a little bit more like what you want her to do, and you give her another treat. <laughs> this is in animal, in animal uh, training, this is called uh, shaping. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's reminiscent of what we do with our AI agents. We, they explore a problem, and uh, they just wait and see where they get a reward. And when they get a reward, they compute uh, a quantity that's called the reward prediction error. They're always trying to predict how well things are going to go for them in the future. And when they get a reward, uh, if they weren't predicting it, they produce this thing, signal called an RPE, a reward prediction error, and that's what drives learning. So every time I'm positively surprised, I try something and, I, and I'm surprised, ooh, I got a treat for that. Mm -hmm. uh, then I, I change my own behavior so that I'm more likely to do that thing in the future. Now let's say I try something and I expect to get a treat. I expect to get some reward, but I don't get some reward. That means I was wrong. I have a negative reward prediction error. I'm disappointed. In that setting, I change my behavior so I'm less likely to do whatever it is that I did um, that led to that outcome. And in this way, my behavior is gradually pointed more and more toward, toward patterns that, that, that yield reward. So this is, this is actually the method that, that um, was used to uh, tackle Atari games at DeepMind, AlphaGo and AlphaChess and AlphaZero use a combination of these two strategies right. where uh, there are positive and negative reward prediction errors. Gee, I won that game. Uh, I, you know, that's a positive surprise. Maybe I should update my way of playing Go to make it more likely that I'll do that sort of thing in the future. AlphaGo has another component, which is model-based, though, where it has an internal model of how, uh, how the pieces move around the board, and it, it thinks through the, the moves that it could take hmm. uh, and, and tries to um, use that to improve its estimate of what's a good move and what's a bad move. But that, so that's an overview of the, the different ways that we tackle these reinforcement learning uh, problems. Wow, that's really well described. Thank you. So, uh, so reinforcement learning is an example uh, of something that was brought into neuroscience uh, to explain how learning might work in the brain. Um, yes. So, so what is the standard model of, of reward-driven learning uh, in the brain in terms of the dopamine story, that is the, the sort yeah. of well-known story. Yeah, this is a beautiful historical example of a case where understanding natural intelligence inspired AI um, by giving rise to the reinforcement learning paradigm. And then after that field of AI research matured, it sort of returned the favor to uh, studies of biological intelligence. It was in the um, in the 90s that a group of researchers, including uh, Reed Montague and Wolfram Schultz and Peter Diane, mm -hmm. made the realization that this reward prediction error that uh, is at the center of uh, these model-free reinforcement learning algorithms shows behavior that is very directly mirrored by what you see if you record from dopamine neurons. So as I understand the history, they were, they were reading about new data from Wolfram Schultz's lab. Wolfram records from dopamine neurons in monkeys and, and other animals. 
And it was there was this aha moment where they said that looks exactly like a reward prediction error. No it way. Like, Those aha you know, <laughs> moments don't happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, you, that's what you that's what you live for as a scientist. Yeah, is that right. aha moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that connection, um, it turns out, uh, appears to be at least coarsely quite valid when monkeys and other animals and including humans, when when we're surprised by a reward outcome. When uh, we get reward we weren't expecting, that's when dopamine gets excited. Right. When we're disappointed, we were expecting some reward and it fails to materialize, we get a dip in dopamine release. And there are many, many details of dopaminergic functioning that fit with this, with this account. And so the, the standard story, so to speak, has become uh, this temporal difference reward prediction error uh, account of dopamine, where if there's a positive reward surprise, there's a, uh, an unexpected reward, dopamine uh, release increases, and this serves as a learning, this le serves to drive learning. So I said before in the AI setting that if you have a positive reward prediction error, you should make yourself more likely to do whatever it is you just did again in the future, um, because it turned out better than you thought. Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly the mechanism that lies at the heart of the neuroscience theory. The, the idea is that dopamine is released into parts of the brain that are responsible for shaping behavioral policies, uh, stimulus response associations, including parts of the striatum, a nucleus deep in the brain. Uh, and when there's a positive reward prediction error, the strength of the connection between the perceptual input that you had and the action that you produced is increased. Um, so you're you know, in that sense, more likely to do that thing again in the future. Um, and then uh, obviously you can flip the sign on that for negative reward prediction errors um, and you get a weakening of those associations. Mm -hmm. So the story in neuroscience is remarkably parallel you know, all of those ways to, to, the, to the AI story. The way that we train AI systems these days really does parallel quite, quite immediately what we believe is going on uh, in the brain driven by dopamine. Okay, so, so dopamine is a reinforcement learning system. And I said yeah. at the outset that you guys used a reinforcement learning system to train another reinforcement learning system in, right. in your earlier work. Now, uh, the prefrontal cortex is known to also represent a lot of representations that underlie uh, reinforcement learning as well. Yeah. Um, and I guess the new thing that you guys have posited and explored here is that prefrontal cortex is its own self-contained reinforcement learning system. And, and you can explain this a little bit further, that the dopamine system serves to train the prefrontal cortex reinforcement learning system. And in that way is meta learning and allows us to speed up our learning and generalize to uh, other tasks. Yeah. Yeah. So, so two things. One, so how do these systems work together as a meta reinforcement learning system, first mm -hmm. of all? So I think the, the way to come at it that makes it easiest to understand is to start by talking about different kinds of memory. When you're thinking about how memory plays out in the brain, there are at least two different mechanisms by which some piece of information could be stored in memory. You could change the synapses, right? You could change the connection strengths between neurons. This is a way we know for sure that, that long-term memory is encoded. So, right. you know, if, um, uh, you know, if we if we remember this interview a month from now, it'll clearly be the case that there were some that we remember it because there were some synapses that were changed in our brains, and the the strength of those synapses is what is what stores the information, stores the memory of this of this event. Mm -hmm. There's another way that you can store information in memory in the brain, though, which is simply at the level of neural activity. So if I if I have to remember um, a telephone number for a few seconds. I guess nobody really has to do that anymore, but this, <laughs> this, this is the old fashioned example that we always you're, use. You're showing your age. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, I, I need to remember some short list of something uh, just for a few minutes, for a few seconds. My brain doesn't need to change the connection weights to do that. I just need to hold, so to speak, hold it actively in memory. So let's say, let's say there are some neurons in my brain that when they fire, uh, when they're active, they're representing the number two. And there's another group of neurons that when they're active, they're representing the number three and so forth. So I can, I can hold a, a telephone number in mind without changing any of my synaptic weights, without changing the connections between neurons, just by keeping those neurons active for a while. Mm -hmm. 
we think that that's a mechanism involved in working memory. That's the term we use in, in cognitive psychology. Uh, working memory is just the kind of memory that you use to maintain information over short periods, to actively maintain some piece of information that you know you're going to need shortly. So, so there's this distinction between weight-based or synapse-based memory and activation-based memory. So how does activation-based memory work? Well, in order for those, for those neurons to stay active, one mechanism by which that can happen is a feedback loop. So in other words, one of these neurons becomes active. How does it stay active? I can keep feeding input to that neuron by reading that telephone number over and over again from a page, but that's not really holding it in memory. A good way to hold it in memory would be to have a feedback loop where I activate those neurons, and then I have a connection from those neurons that eventually forms a loop back to themselves so that when they fire, they, ex they keep themselves firing. They excite themselves. It's a positive feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And we know that these kind of feedback loops exist all over in the brain, uh, and we think that that's a mechanism by which the brain holds information uh, active over short periods. That's a mechanism for working memory. And the prefrontal cortex is a critical place for this to happen. Right. So, so you can think of the prefrontal cortex very, at a very high level of abstraction as a big feedback loop, a big circuit that once you, once you make certain, un, certain neurons in that circuit active, they will tend to stay active and maintain information over time. So now imagine using that kind of system to learn. Let's say I'm, uh, I'm in a casino. And I'm trying to decide which of these slot machines is, is most likely to pay off. You know, a good way of solving that problem, assuming there aren't too many slot machines that I'm considering, is to try them out, right? You know, I try this one over here for a while. I try that one over there for a while. And I see where I win more often. And eventually, with enough data, I decide, ah, it's that one over there that's paying off more often. Um, in machine learning, this is called a bandit problem um, based on that exact analogy. So notice that in order to do that kind of learning, I have to main, I have to hold in memory the information that I've gathered so far. I have to maintain some sort of record of which machine I tried and whether I won on that machine. And I need to continually update that record mm -hmm. of my past experiences in order to be able to decide what to do now. This is just a definition of learning, really. So in the standard dopamine story, that learning is happening at the level of synaptic connections. Right. I play a machine, I win, I change my synaptic weights. I play a machine, I lose, I change my synaptic weights. But it's, it's equally plausible that our brains handle this kind of learning situation in that other way, using activities. So I have a certain bunch of neurons in my prefrontal cortex that when they're active, it means I played that machine and I won. And another set of neurons that's, that when they're active, they mean I, I played that machine and I lost. And so I can maintain a record of what's happened so far by just activating certain neurons in my prefrontal cortex. Um, and together they encode uh, information about what I've tried and how well it went. And I can use that information to choose my next action. But, it, but in, so, in that case, doesn't the, correct, doesn't the right signal need to be input into that um, network for, those, for that activation to take place to know, oh, this is the third from the left? Uh, absolutely, okay. absolutely, right. So just the way that in order to hold onto a telephone number, in your working memory, at some point, your ears have to receive the telephone number. Um, there has to be some sensory input that gives you the information you want to hold in memory. It's exactly the same in, in, in reinforcement learning. This memory system has to have access to the relevant, the relevant pieces of information. It has to have perceptual information that says, I played that slot machine. That's information about actions as well. Uh, and it has to have information about eventual rewards. Mm -hmm. So the prefrontal cortex has to be getting information about Perceptual inputs, action outputs, and rewards. Fortunately, we know it, it receives all of that right. information. Right. Yeah, the necessary ingredients. Right. Exactly. Prefrontal cortex listens to essentially everything that's going on in the rest of the brain. So it's in a perfect position to integrate that kind of information. So now to, now to kind of put these pieces together, I said before that working memory depends on this kind of feedback loop uh, where neurons excite themselves so that they can stay active once, they're, once they become active. This learning situation requires something more, which is that the circuit has to also update itself every time it gets a new piece of information. So it's not just a question of holding something statically in memory. It's also a question of taking what you already know about those slot machines, adding in the new thing that you just observed, uh, and updating your overall, in, your overall representation of which slot machine is better, and doing that every time you play a new slot machine. So that kind of update requires an appropriate kind of feedback loop, 
right? In other words, the mm. way that new information gets integrated with existing information can't be random. It has to follow the rules of the game. It has to represent the right quantities. And so in order for the system to work, that feedback loop has to be parameterized correctly. The, the synaptic weights in that feedback loop have to be correct. Uh, uh -huh. um, and, so, and so you end up with the question, well, wait, where do those, how do those connection weights get learned? How do those synapses get set so that this feedback loop, this working memory mechanism does the right things um, in a learning situation? And that's where we come back to the dopamine story. So the overall idea in this meta reinforcement learning um, paradigm is that the role of dopamine is to set the strengths of the connection weights in this big recurrent neural network that runs through your prefrontal cortex. And the purpose of adjusting those weights is to set up the right kinds of feedback loops, the right kind of activity dynamics, the right kinds of update rules in that activation-based memory mm -hmm. that really in the end is doing all the work. It's like when you're playing, when you're trying to figure out which of those slot machines is the right one to, to play, that's really all happening at the level of neural activity, at the level of this working memory-based, activity-based uh, memory system. But the reason that that system works in the first place is because dopamine-based learning has very slowly and gradually sculpted it, changed those connection weights so that everything uh, operates the way that it should. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, um, so, so the thing that I, so it does make sense. The thing that I struggle to understand, um, and I didn't, I could have read your previous paper in more detail, I think, is how the reinforcement learning works within the prefrontal cortex in this case, within the activation dynamics, right? So you input yeah. a signal. And to my mind, if all of the weights are fixed, as you do you, in the, uh, in the network, you fix, you train the, the prefrontal cortex with dopamine, and then you fix the weights. Yeah. And then you start asking it questions. Then you, then you test it. And That's right. you see that the reinforcement learning is working within the activation, activation dynamics. That's and right. I'm, and I'm struggling to understand how that is working without changing weights. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, it, it's working without changing weights because the weights are already set to do what they need to do. So in other words, imagine you're, you're, you're in, one of, in a very simple bandit problem. So you're just trying to figure out whether to pull the left arm or pull the right arm uh, on a two-arm bandit, a slot machine. Imagine a slot machine with two arms. <laughs> so now, what do the activities of those, those neurons have to represent? They have to represent at any given point how confident you are that the left arm is the good arm or that the right arm is the, is the, is the good arm. So you could, you, you could get by with a very, sim, very small neural network that had maybe only two, two units in it, maybe even only one unit, right? The, the point is that you just have to say where you are on that confidence scale. I see. So what, are the, what do the connection weights have to do? Well, they have to assure that when you, let's say I play the left arm and I get rewarded. The system then has to update its confidence representation, right? It has to say, uh, oh, now I think I, I'm a little bit more sure that the left arm is the good arm because I just played that arm and I, uh, and I won. So all the, all the recurrent network, all the recurrent weights have to do is make sure that, uh, that the, the activities of those units shift in the right direction. I see. And stay, and stay put. You can think of a, I mean, another way of coming at this is to, is to imagine, just to think about what re recurrent dynamics of a neural network are, right? So any, neural, any recurrent neural network, any network that has feedback connections will have dynamics. Its activity patterns will tend to evolve in a certain way because the activities go through those connection weights and, and influence the next pattern of activity, which influences the next pattern of activity. The dynamics can be stable. So if the, if the weights are exactly right, uh, a cer certain patterns of activity will stay put. They right. will just stay as they are. But the dynamics are also defined in terms of what happens when you perturb the system. Right? So it's not just a question of how the activity dynamics evolve endogenously without yeah, any yeah. external input. The dynamics are also defined in terms of what happens if you poke the system from the outside? What happens if you apply a particular kind of excitatory input or a, a particular kind of inhibitory input? So now, so, and, and the, the dynamics, the way that the dynamics of the system responds to external perturbations is also governed by those recurrent connection weights. This right? is, okay, this is becoming very clear to me now. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, and, and so you can think about learning as playing out in that kind of setting. It's not just kind of 
the int intrinsic dynamics of the system. It's also about the way that the system responds to external inputs. And the external inputs here are observations literally like, I played the left arm and I won. I played the right arm and I lost. And so the dynamics of the system in those settings, the activities in the system should update in just the right way in order to change the representation of the confidence. Is it the right arm? Is it the left arm? In a way that's rational and proper given the recent observations. So the, the trick is to get the connection weights exactly right so that these external inputs change the state of the network in just the right way. Uh, and that's the role of the of the dopamine driven learning. It's all clear to me now, and hopefully it's clear to the listeners as well. So uh, I hope so. That really scratched it's, my itch. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of these things where, um, I, you know, what what I find is that it's something that sounds very complicated and uh, abstruse until you get the insight, right. and then it seems very obvious and simple. Right. You know, the other obvious and simple thing to me is that these one arm bandit problems. I mean, in in reality. I take my grandmother to the casino and, and just watch her put the money in over and over and nothing really comes out. So <laughs> yeah, in, in the real world, you can't win a bandit problem. No, I like your casino yeah. better than mine. I think. Yeah, exactly. So cool. Okay. So, so kind of in summary uh, of this work, you have this dopaminergic system that uh, is its own reinforcement learning system uh, and it's training uh, a prefrontal cortex uh, reinforcement learning system that operates under activation dynamics under a different r regime. Right. And you guys have tested this on multiple uh, different tasks, like the one on bandit problems with a bunch of different probabilities. And, and you've seen that the, the uh, learning takes place faster, just as you would hope it would in these reinforcement learning systems that are training each other. So I know that uh, there are more things to work on um, and that there are some drawbacks, some shortcomings of, of the research. We're not going to get into them in the interest of time, because I know uh, time is limited. But, you know, what could this meta reinforcement system uh, be used for moving forward? Well, one of the things that you have used it for is training theory of mind into machines. Um, so we won't go too in depth in this paper in, uh, in the interest of time, but you have this really recent paper called Machine Theory of Mind, uh, where you use meta-learning to build a theory of mind network, and you call it TomNet, as in theory of mind net. What is theory of mind and how much do we neuroscientifically know about it? And, uh, and, and maybe I'll just leave it to you just, just to kind of describe what you guys did in this paper and, and why it's important. Um, so I won't badger you with detailed questions here. Sure. Um, I should mention my collaborators on this work. So mm. in the meta RL work, I just want to give a shout out to Jane Wong and Zeb Kurth Nelson who really led the way on that, on, on the, the computational work there in the, in the TomNet stuff. Um, I worked with, uh, Neil Rabinowitz, uh, Francis Song, um, and other collaborators. So theory of mind is a term that comes out of psychology. It's widely used in developmental psychology and it, and it refers simply to, uh, the idea that we understand when we interact with other people that, there's something going on inside those people's heads that isn't directly observable, but which explains their behavior. And it, it involves especially uh, beliefs and desires. So we, we make inferences about what other people know or believe from the things that they do. And we make inferences about what they want, uh, what they're trying to bring, what outcomes they're trying to bring about, uh, what they like. Um, again, from, from their behavior. So um, this kind of internal model that we have of other people and their psychological um, activities uh, is referred to in psychology as, uh, as theory of mind. So what do we know about theory of mind from a neuroscience point of view? I would say, honestly, very little. Yeah, we, right. We've learned a lot about theory of mind from psychology a lot of the information that we've gained through psycho psychology research is, a, is about the course of cognitive development. Mm. At what age do children acquire con particular concepts about the minds of others? Um, what is the developmental trajectory? When it comes to neuroscience, I should just you know, mention that this isn't a particular area of expertise for me on the neuroscience side. So mm. uh, there may be pe recent pieces of work that will... Um, contradict what I'm about to say. But my, my, my impression so far is that, you know, we have a maybe very broad notion of what large scale brain areas might be involved in the computations that underlie these kinds of inferences. But understanding things at a finer neuro computational right. level of granularity 
is definitely um, not something that we've attained yet um, in neuroscience. So these, so the mechanisms that underlie theory of mind are very much, you know, th- these are very much open questions, both in neuroscience and in AI work. So um, what, there's what a lot that? of interesting, so I just want to add, there's a yeah. lot of very interesting and powerful cognitive modeling mm. uh, that's been done um, in order to formalize, uh, in, a, in a sort of, we were talking earlier about the algorithmic letter, level, the computational algorithmic level. Right. Um, there are cognitive models that capture the way that these inferences play out, but we don't know much about the neuroscience. So one of the points you make in the paper is uh, kind of a, a problem, a recurring issue that comes up when people discuss these things is that we don't understand these AI systems. We don't understand how they're working. So it's important for an AI system to be able to tell us essentially how it's working. And and that's one reason why you went about uh, trying to build theory of mind into the machines. And you make the point that as humans, we don't understand each other at the level of single neuron activity. We have these abstract mental models of each other. Yeah. And yeah. so you're, the way you built in theory of mind into these machines is not to understand every individual unit and what that means, but to build an abstract model of another machine. And so I, I think that's a really interesting way to go uh, forward. So maybe you can just take it from there and, and talk about what you, know, what you did. Yeah, I think our motivation in this work was, it was multifaceted. We, you're absolutely right that one of the things that we had on our minds was how are we going to understand these AI systems that we're building? Um, and we had the kind of you know, cheeky idea that maybe we could use AI to understand AI. Just as we understand one another at the level of these abstractions, beliefs, desires, and so forth, maybe we can discover the right abstractions that would allow us to understand the behavior of the AI systems that we're building without having to understand what every little unit in these deep neural networks is doing. And we, by the way, maybe we can also constrain the representations that arise in these understanding systems so that they align with what humans uh, are naturally positioned to understand. Well, that, that's not to say that uh, we, we couldn't use every single unit in, a, uh, in an AI system because, you know, the, it's called the black box problem, but then often people, I don't remember who coined the uh, term, it might be Dan Yeamans, but it was really a white box problem because we do have access to all the units. It's just that that might not be a useful way of going about doing it. Right? Exactly. I mean, I, I think there's a there's a perception among neuroscientists that part of the problem is that they 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 don't have enough data about what's going on in the brain. This was, you know, maybe up until ten years ago before these amazing new neuroscience techniques uh, hit yeah. the hit the hit the bench, you know, people had to make inferences about what was going on in entire brains looking at like eight neurons at a time. <laughs> um, and there was a kind of envy, I guess, uh, toward, um, people studying AI systems because, gee, you know, y- y- you <laughs> folks get access to every little bit of what's going on under the hood. Right. But, um, but it's a curse, you know, it, blessing and it, a curse. It, exactly. And, and, and neuroscience now is in a, an analogous position because, uh, it is possible now to record from thousands, hundreds or thousands of neurons, depending on the technique you're using at once. But even when you have access to that kind of large scale data set, it's very hard to figure out what's actually going on um, and figuring out the low dimensional structure that actually underlies, uh, you know, what's happening in these high dimensional systems is a really challenging problem, both for neuroscience and AI. So the idea in the work that we did was to say, look, rather than trying to figure all of this out as human researchers, let's build a learning system that will discover the, these, the proper level of abstraction for itself. And so the, the basic idea was let's take a model that observes another behaving system uh, and just tries to predict what that other system, that other agent is going to do next. And the only twist on that is that instead of just allowing our theory of mind network to observe what this target agent is doing right now, we also give it several examples of what this same observed agent uh, has done recently in the past. To give you the in- intuition, if, I, if I'm shown several YouTube videos uh, that show me uh, the last several restaurants that you went to and what you ate there. I can make some inferences about that, about what you're likely to do at the next restaurant you right, go to. Right. If you keep going to cheesesteak restaurants, then the probability becomes much higher that you're going to go to another cheesesteak restaurant. He says from Philadelphia. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I've got cheesesteaks on the mind here. So, uh, you know, that's exactly the the strategy that we used in this in this theory of mind work, was let's just build a system that learns to take observations from past experience, but from past behavior, I should say, and to make predictions about uh, what should be observed then in new behavior. 
And to train the system across, importantly, to train the system across a diverse set of observed agents. So maybe if I if I watch some videos of what you did at the last several restaurants you went to, um, I can also watch videos of what uh, somebody else did at, at um, in their last few restaurant visits, and I can watch videos for say a hundred other people. And and if I can do that, then I can not only make predictions about individuals, but I can develop a sense of what the different categories or dimensions are that underlie behavior. Maybe there are some people that like fast food. If I see you go to Burger King over and over again, then I might predict that you're more likely to go to McDonald's than that you're likely to go to some fancy French restaurant, mm -hmm. right? Because I understand some people just like fast food. And I can, I can learn what we call a low-dimensional manifold that, that describes the range of behavior that we see across a population. And this is something that, you know, there are low dimensional manifolds that, that describe human behavior. Decades of research into the structure of human personalities mm. has led to these dimensional models where there are debates about exactly how many dimensions there are to human personality, but there aren't that many. There's somewhere on the order of five dimensions that really do capture a lot about what makes a particular person, what gives them the personality that they have. So the idea in this machine learning or AI project was to build a learning system that can identify that kind of low dimensional structure and figure out, oh, I see there are, there are different kinds of people and here are the particular kinds of ways in which people differ. That, and, and armed with that kind of knowledge, then I can observe the behavior of a new person and very quickly make mm. inferences about what else that person's likely to do. Yeah. Does that make good. sense? Yep, yeah, that's good. So this is, so you guys implemented this and I'll, I'll point people uh, to the paper. Uh, it's just, it's really fun. You say cheeky, I say fun work uh, <laughs> that you guys are doing. So Matt, we're really up against time here. I want to ask you, I usually ask, you know, a few broad general questions to uh, each sure. guest. So uh, I will just ask you a few here then, and then I will, I will let you go. You're only three hours away from French fries on a sandwich. So I'm sure after this, <laughs> you got to you got to get there. So uh, that's exactly right. <laughs> so, so what is something that's uh, a little out there uh, that you, that someone else might find hard to swallow that you believe will come out? You know, maybe after you've had a couple drinks, it, it catch you off guard. You might say that oh, I think this is going to come out of the interface of neuroscience and AI. Well, I I I'm a believer that it won't take any special kind of magic for AI systems to develop a representation of self. Oh, man. Actually, some of the first work I did as a graduate student um, in Pittsburgh was about, about self-representation. There's a, a thing that's come to be known as the rubber hand illusion, ah. um, which is something that I, I um, dreamt up when I was a graduate student, um, which is about, it's an illusion that sort of reveals something about why we think our bodies are, belong to us, why they're why, why my body is me uh, as opposed to other things in the environment, which aren't me. What I took away from that research was that there's really nothing magical about that. It's just that there are certain patterns of correlation in our perception. So, you know, m my hand is me simply in the sense that when something touches it, I feel that. I have a tactile experience. That's not true of the desk that's in front of me. If something touches the desk, I don't feel it. That's a very fundamental um, difference that's detectable from it's detectable in perceptual data. So you can, build, you can build a representation of what the bodily self is as opposed to other objects in the environment simply from the structure of the perceptual data that you get. I think the same is going to be true. I think it's going to be turtles all the way down. I think so you once we have... Sorry. You, you, don't, you don't think embodied cognition is important, the, the embodiment of the cognitive processes is, is oh, no, a no. special ingredient or something. No, I, I think embodiment is hugely important, but really all that's needed for this to start happening is embodiment per se. Yeah. If, you, if you have an agent that has a body, yeah. uh, it has multiple senses, um, and it's capable of uh, encoding the patterns of correlation between different senses um, and how those depend on the interaction between the body and other objects in the world, then this just spontaneously gives rise to a distinction between the body and the world the self and the rest of the world. And I have this idea that more cognitive notions of selfhood will also arise in that same way. So if we have, you know, our brains have memory systems, our brains have attentional systems. If we then have internal models of how those things work, uh, something that psychologists call metacognition, 
you know, if we have systems that build those kinds of statistical models, I think it'll just happen that they develop a sense of, uh, of self in, in exactly the way that, that, that humans have. So I don't think anything magical is going to be needed. I think once we start scaling AI systems up, you know, so that they can interact with richer and richer environments, I think they're just going to spontaneously develop representations of self that correspond to what we, what we have in mind when we use that term. This isn't a, an idea that's unique to me. So uh, a former colleague of mine at Princeton, Michael Graziano, has been talking about consciousness uh, in, in these terms that you, right. the, the, brain, the brain has an internal model of how attention works. And that, pure and simple, is what is. we mean when yeah. we say consciousness. I think he's onto something there, and I think people in AI are are getting interested in that, those ideas too. So I don't know whether that counts as something out there or not, but um, I, I think so. But, that that's a really good answer. But thanks for scaring the bejesus out of my listeners here. That <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not scary. I, I find the idea that an AI system could have a sense of self kind of reassuring in a way. Well, it is, but then there's well, right, because then there's no special sauce. But then you know, there's the the fear that oh, well, one day it's going to get complex enough that it's just going to then become self aware and then. To take over the world, et cetera. Uh, that's another conversation, but I also have hopefully reassuring things to say about that. <laughs> well, what do you think? Theory that... of mind Theory of mind is very important, by the way, right? Because we want AI systems that understand humans. Here's something that's out that, you know, one thing that I wonder about, and, and you know, one thing to say about AI safety is that, and it's something I try to say every time I get into a conversation of that kind, is people in the AI community are taking AI safety extremely seriously. There, there's a large sector of people at DeepMind whose full-time job it is to think mm. about that. Mm. You know, we really are serious when we say we want to solve intelligence and then use it to make the world a better place. I mean, that's not just advertising boilerplate. Um, people really care about this. One thing I wonder about, though, is, you know, the narrative, especially in Hollywood, is that once, once AI systems become self-aware, they're going to become violent and take over the world and, and you know, it's going to be the end of civilization. I wonder, I mean, I, I don't want to treat this as an experiment and I don't think anybody in the AI world does, but I, just on a speculative level, why couldn't it be that AI systems are incredibly benevolent? You know, when we think about wisdom in studies of religion and spirituality, our usual assumption is that insight leads to benevolence. Right. So, you know, I just want to put, out, put that out there that it's a, it's a possibility AI safety is something that we have to take very seriously, and we don't want to do anything that puts uh, anybody at risk at any at any level of of the scale of our society. But I wonder, I wonder. Hmm. Now that's definitely out there. It so, is, yeah. So, we'll, <laughs> we will we will find out one day. That's the beauty of it, I, you know. I think we will. I think we will. What's something that you wish was on your CV that's not? I wish there was a section on a standard CV where you could list your debts. <laughs> oh, your gratitude debts. I yes, see. where you could where you could list the people or the pieces of work or oh, papers yeah. that had a dramatic effect on your life, because I could easily do that. Um, there are people like uh, Jay McClelland and David Rumblehart and Jeff Hinton, Alan Newell, who changed my life in a very you know a very tangible way. And you know I think it's true of anybody working in science that you always feel like you're standing on the shoulder of giants. And it would be nice if there was a CV section where you could list that. One thing I think that people working in AI don't fully appreciate, maybe because a lot of them are, are young, is how recently all of these tools we're using were developed. Right. Everything I do in the course of my workday was invented essentially when I was in high school. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's true on the AI side and in the neuroscience side. There are precursors, but really everything I'm doing was made possible by research that was going on when I was in high school and early in college. And it would be lovely if there were a place on my CV to give a shout out to the people who did that amazing pioneering work um, that really makes my life possible. Man, that's <clears throat> speaking of the benevolence of the higher cognitive self-aware processes, you know, <laughs> here we go. So your proof, proof is in the pudding. Uh, <laughs> if self-awareness is going to kind of arise, you know, out of all these other uh, traits that we program into these intelligent systems. Is there anything that you think is, and you mentioned music, for instance, and, and sort of the longer term uh, overtures of music as being yeah. a somewhat difficult or interesting problem. Do you see any trait of intelligence um, that will you think will be especially difficult uh, to build in uh, into general AI? So there are clearly particular aspects of cognition that are 
that present current challenges. So long-term temporal credit assignment, you know, making connections at yeah. large temporal scales is one uh, that we've already discussed. Having the right kinds of abstractions that guide rapid learning is another one that we've already discussed. What I want to come back to in your question is the phrase build in, because mm. to some extent, I, I'm a believer that there's only so much we're going to be able to build in. We need systems that that learn the right kinds of things from interacting with the world. And that's where one of the biggest current challenges comes in. Because if that's the strategy, if we want AI systems to develop rich knowledge from interactions with the world, then we have to have a rich world for them to interact with. And right now, I mean, we could just use the real world, right? We could deploy AI, AI systems in the actual world that we're inhabiting. That's a hard thing to do because learning in real time through interaction with the real physical world uh, is slow and it requires, frankly, robotics techniques that we don't have. Robotics is uh, a really developing field. It's hard to get robots to do what we want them to do. Right. So to deploy AI systems, to put them in the same kind of situation that a, a young child is in and hope that they'll learn in that exact setting is really beyond our reach. We don't have we don't have systems that learn fast enough or that are good enough at interacting with the physical world to do that. So, so instead, we rely on simulation environments, simulated environments. And that's why video games are such a great boon for AI research, right. because they give us an environment where the goals are well-defined, the solutions are tricky to discover, but where uh, an, an AI agent stands a chance of exploring and discovering the right, the right way to solve a problem. The, pr the problem is that even the richest video games, even the most complex video games that we currently have pale in comparison to the real world in terms of their right. semantic richness and diversity. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so we end up with a, with a problem that's not so much about how we build our agents, but rather how we build the environments into which we introduce these environments, the environments that provide the training data for the learning systems that mm -hmm. we're building. And this is, a, this is, I think, a challenge right now being confronted by the whole AI community. If we want rich knowledge through learning, we need rich environments yeah. um, where learning can, can occur. To some extent, there's a kind of irony in this because it means that we have to start thinking, well, what does it mean for an environment to be rich? If we want an, if we want an artificial agent to acquire a particular kind of concept or abstraction, then we have to build the environment in such a way that that, that abstract idea is both necessary for successfully behaving in that environment and also available from that environment. And so we have to start building environments very deliberately so that they, they have those properties, which means that in a way we're in danger of getting back into the original knowledge engineering. Track. Right, right. In, in good old fashioned AI, the problem was, oh gosh, you know, we have to build all of this knowledge into our agents and that's essentially impossible. And now there's the, the risk that we're facing an analogous challenge is, oh, we have to build a world that's rich enough that it'll give rise to real intelligence in these learning systems um, how do we build a world that that's that's that rich? I think of uh, you know for 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 listeners to your podcast who read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, mm. there was a character Slarty Bartfast who <laughs> built a replica of you know part of the the world. He built I think the the fjords of Sweden or something. And to some extent, AI research is turning into that. We're trying to build these very rich environments, um, and it's a fascinating challenge. But I think it's one of the most difficult challenges that we're we're facing right now in AI research. Matt, thanks for spending so much time with me today. And, uh, I, you know, I'll have to have you back on because there's just so much more to talk about and continued success with your work. And uh, uh, I just I wish you the best and I appreciate what you're doing. So so thanks for being here. Thank you so much. It was uh, it was a real delight for me. Thanks. Brain Inspired is a production of me. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling two or four dollars per month. Go to patreon.com slash braininspired or go to the website braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. Your contribution will help keep this show going without any annoying advertisements like you hear on other shows. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stare